We are glad that you have joined us here today and, uh, and have, have made your way to be a part of our community this morning, whether you are online or whether you're here in person. And I'm excited because a lot of you have already been coming to us and saying this series has been really useful um, in thinking about how we understand our lives and how we understand um, how we understand what God is doing in our lives at this particular moment in history. And we're talking through what it means to rebuild, to, to put things back together after things have broken apart. And for so many of us, that breaking apart was violent and sudden, and we didn't expect it, and we had no expectation it was coming. Some of us have lost loved ones. Some of us have lost our jobs. Some of us have lost uh, practices in our lives that were really core to who we were, like going to Whataburger every Friday night and you know, pigging out in the, in, the, in the dining room there, or whatever it is that was really important to you. And something about all of our lives has broken apart over the last 12 to 14 months, and we now have an opportunity, as many of us are coming back, to build whatever we want to build. Like, in some ways, things falling apart are terrible. And in some ways, things falling apart create an awesome opportunity. When everything has fallen apart and when everything is broken— it's a great opportunity to get wins, to, to, to build something in your life, to, to grow something in your life. And, and that's what we all have an opportunity to do right now. But if you're like me, I, I, I'm at least questioning, okay, so I know what my life used to look like. I know how, how devastatingly small my life became over the last 12 to 14 months. But now, as my calendar starts to fill back up, as I start to be involved in more things, what do I want to put in those? Do I really want all of the stuff? Yesterday, I, I finally, after eight years, got a new computer. My wife's been telling me to buy a new computer for so long because it barely functions, and I was like, every day I would like speak really nice to it and like stroke its side just to keep it going. Um, and I fi my, wife was, my wife for like a year has been saying, just go get a new computer and quit complaining about it. Um, but if you know me, that's not what I do. I just complain about it, and then eventually, um, and then eventually it dies. Like that, that's kind of how men approach underwear and socks, like that sort of, same sort of perspective. And, uh, and so I was, you know, I was, I was doing that, trying to get my computer, but I finally got the new one. And so the first thing your new computer asks you when you have, when you have the same kind of computer is it asks you, what from your old computer would you like to transfer to the new computer? Everything, nothing, or something in between? And I was looking at these things, and I was like, there are a lot of things on my old computer, files, little, you know, bits of information, data, that I probably don't need. It's like when you move from a house to a house and you have this awesome opportunity to throw out a whole bunch of stuff because you realize just how much stuff you have. Or maybe the truck is only so big. And this was my opportunity. And, and I, at the end of the day, I finally just decided to transfer most of the things to my new computer. But I, I think this is kind of the opportunity we've got. How many of the old things that you did before would you like to bring in? What are the, th what are the lessons that you've learned and how many of those things would you like to bring in? That's what we have the opportunity to learn. And, and what we're looking at in the Bible is this story of, of the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Because we know that Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. And there was this miraculous thing that happened where Cyrus the Great, the emperor of the Persian Empire, decided to send back in some Jewish people to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And, and it did not go as easy as they would have thought as is the case with most projects that you've probably ever done in your life. And so as we've been looking at the story, we've been trying to pick up some lessons from this story. So today we're going to look at a character whose name I love, and I, 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 argued, I argued to try and get this to be one of my kids' names, but my wife wouldn't go for it. The name Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. Right? Wouldn't that be a great name? We could call him Zerub, short, like, or Bubble, or what, something. Uh, Zerubbabel is the guy that we're talking about today. Zerubbabel was the, the, the person, the, the Jewish leader that was put in charge of leading the people back into Jerusalem and starting the building of Jerusalem again. And so we read that he goes back there with 40,000, over 40,000, like 43,000 Jewish people that had been in exile, brings them back to the city of Jerusalem and wants to start the rebuilding process. And you've got to imagine what it would look like. It's almost like if your house is burned down and you go back outside and you realize what has been lost. And as they approach Jerusalem, they must have wondered, what has been lost here? 
They must have really wept at the destruction that they saw. But at some level, kind of like we are right now, they also probably got a little tinge of excitement about we could create something new. You know that leak that we always had in the old temple in the, in the back corner? We could finally fix that! Remember that, that front column that always drove me crazy every time I came to the temple? We can finally make a better one. And this is the opportunity we always have to rebuild. So we're going to look at Ezra, which is probably a book that you've not spent a lot of time reading in your, in your Bible life. Ezra chapter 4, and we're going to be starting at verse 1. Ezra chapter 4, starting at verse 1. Now, they had started rebuilding... And then something happened, and this is what happened. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles uh, were building the temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel, and the heads of the families said, Let us help you build, because like you, we seek your God, and have been sacrificing to him since Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. So you've got these people that when this, when this big switcheroo happened and the, when Nebuchadnezzar or, or whatever Babylonian king had moved them out, took them out and put them in lots of different places to try and confuse them and make them less powerful, he put some other people back into Israel. And one of the things that we find out in this story is that those people that he put back into Israel were not just the godless fiends that everybody thought they were. They were actually sacrificing to, the, to Yahweh, to the Jewish God. They, they, ex- they accepted the, relig- the local religion, and we're doing that, which is really funny because the people who left Jerusalem weren't even doing that. But Zerubbabel said, Joshua and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, you have no part with us in building the temple to our God. We alone will build it to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. And then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They bribed officials to work against them and to frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Now, what we find out in this story was that they, they came up against opposition from the very people that wanted to help them originally. These people who were living in the region who had just had this, these 40,000 people just show back up to, t- to try and get their homeland back, had offered to help, but now they had rejected their offer of help, and now they are starting to cause them problems. Now, I'm going to save you all of the reading of the letters, but what happens from here is that the local leaders from the Persian Empire, which seemed to be a pretty efficient outfit, started writing letters back and forth to each other saying things about what was happening in Jerusalem. And what ultimately happens is that the king, the emperor of Persia, which is no longer Cyrus, but his son, decides that they're no longer going to be doing this project, the building of the temple and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. So they send the order to Zerubbabel to stop. And for almost a decade, maybe even more than a decade, Zerubbabel stopped. The people stopped. The project stopped sat half finished, just similar to most of the projects I've ever started at my house. Maybe not a decade, but I get close sometimes. And that is what we see as where the story's sitting for a long time, and all these letters are being traded back and forth. Now, meanwhile, there's lots of emperors kind of fighting for, jockeying for position in the Persian Empire, and so one of the sons takes over for Cyrus, and then the other son takes over for that son, and then somebody else takes over for both sons. And so you've got this constant changeover of kings, and nations are trying to revolt because the, the, the emperor situation is unstable. And in the middle of this, a new king comes to the throne, and his name is Darius. Darius becomes the new king of Persia, and what Darius hears is the same thing that the previous people have heard, that something is not right in Jerusalem. However... Two prophets arrive on the scene in Jerusalem, and they start telling Zerubbabel, Hey, Zerubbabel, I don't think they'll notice, because they're so busy with all of their emperor stuff, you can just go ahead and get started. And what's more, God is behind you. God is asking you to restart. God is authorizing you to restart. So go ahead and restart without fear that anything is going to happen to you. 
And so Zerubbabel and the other leaders go back to work. If you want to read with me on the, in the next section, we'll read what happens after that. If we can bring, bring that up on the screen. Ezra, Ezra chapter 6, starting at verse 14. So the elders of the Jews continued to build and prosper under the preaching of, of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet and the descendant of Iddo. And they finished building the temple according to the command of, God, of the God of Israel and the, decree, the decrees of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, kings of Persia. The temple was completed on the third day of the month of Adar in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. Then the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. For the dedication of the house of God, they offered a hundred bulls, two hundred rams, four hundred male lambs as a sin offering for Israel, twelve male goats, one for each of the tribes of Israel. Can you imagine that many animals, by the way, being sacrificed? Even if it was like over the course of a few days, like that place must have stunk. Whew. But they were creating the feeling of being back. We're back. We finally have the temple rebuilt. And they celebrated like there was no tomorrow, that something had happened. And, and the, the, there was a complaint that as they were building, went to Darius and said, Darius, they're starting to rebuild. You told them not to. And by God's grace, Darius goes up to this tower. There's a tower in Persia where he is. And he goes and finds this tower and he finds a scroll. And the scroll says, in order of Cyrus the Great, rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And so, and so he sends a letter back to the leaders in that part of the world. And he says, nope, actually they're good. Let them do it. Don't stop them. In fact, he actually asked them to be facilitated by the people nearby to give them things and, and get them going on their journey. So I, th I think that we can look at this story and see a few different things. One is that our good friend Zerubbabel is a complicated character, at the very least. Zerubbabel is going to this place. He's clearly willing to be a risk taker, right? He's leaving his, his home, he's leaving the place where he stays, and he's going to Jerusalem to try and rebuild these walls. He knows there's going to be opposition, and he goes anyways, and he leads these 40,000 people back to their homeland. And if you know the stories of the Old Testament, leading 40,000 Jewish people through the desert is not an easy task, just ask Moses, okay? But he does it, and he brings them to that place. Now, once he gets there, one of the interesting things to me about Zerubbabel is he has these people come and ask if they can help. Have you ever had the situation in your life where you're working on something in your yard and your neighbor who you really don't talk to decides to come over and ask if they can assist you? Now, I, maybe you are a better human being than I am, but my first response to that is always, nope, I'm good, I've got it. Now, like half the time, I really do want their help, but that's just awkward and I don't want to deal with awkwardness for two hours, right? And then I'm going to feel indebted to them and then like there's like... I'm not, I'm not a great person for taking help. Some of you know this, right? Like, help is not the number one thing that I seek out all of the time. And, and I think that there's a lot of us who fit that profile, that, that would rather try to fail boldly ourselves than to accept help and do it the right way. We all know at some level that's a stupid way to look at things, but we do it anyways. I don't know. I'm going to blame society. It can't be my fault, after all. That's the first tip that we're going to have today. Our first tip for rebuilding and, and tip for understanding rebuilding is that asking, there we go, accepting help is a sign of strength. Now, I, I want to say I'm still really bad at this, but I've learned to get better at it. And the more I have to, the more that helps. Because if you're like me, Performing tasks is something that you have to, like, rip out of my dying finger grip, okay? And if you can do it, it's, it's only helped by the fact that I have so many things in my finger grip that I can't grip very well anymore. And so it makes it a little bit easier to pull and help me. But the more you do this, the more you learn that having people help you, having people be on your team, having help, having people that are, are able to be a part of what you're doing only makes your impact greater. 
My dear friend Sarah Weir is back there. Sarah is our assistant director at the Navigation Center. Uh, Kimberly is upstairs. She's the assistant pastor here at Sunrise. Both of those people, I used to do all of the things that they currently do. And it doesn't really, it wasn't really something I was like, oh, I would love to not do all of these things. But you know what's beautiful about adding both of those people to our staff here at Sunrise? We get so much more done. And you know what? They're better at a lot of the things that I used to do than I am. And that's a beautiful thing. And we might not do things exactly the same way, but what you realize is that every time you add someone to your team, your team gets stronger. Even if you would do things a little bit differently, every time you add a person, your team gets stronger. And even if it's difficult for you to, to delegate, even if it's difficult for you to add people to your team, your team gets stronger. We can do more things at the Navigation Center because Sarah Weir is there. We can do more things at the church because Kimberly's on our staff. We can do more things every time we add a person. We can, we're able to create bigger impact because of having a stronger and a better and more capable team. Because this is going to be new information for you, but the world does not revolve around me, okay? I cannot do everything the best. I know this is devastating news for you, and I'm totally sorry that I had to be the one to break it to you. But there are really good people who can pick up the slack. And in your life, I am absolutely certain that there are people who could help you do the things that you do better. For many of you who've done drug and alcohol recovery, you know that unless you accept people onto your team, you are going to fail. Everybody's heard somebody that thinks that they're going to tackle addiction alone and you figure out that eventually they're going to wind themselves up on that and wind themselves back out on that. Like, it's not going to work. And maybe there's another thing in your life. Maybe it's, it's, your, it's your career or it's, it's, it's working through some sort of emotional issue in your life. But having other people on your team, whether it's a therapist or a doctor or a friend or a neighbor or somebody is so important and, and it's always hard for us to accept their help. It's always hard for us to be vulnerable enough to let them in. But almost always, you wind up in a better place when you've got good people on your team. Zerubbabel did not want to have more people on his team. And I want to say that there's actually two different interpretations of this section. Some people give Zerubbabel the benefit of the doubt and say that he was only supposed to build the temple with Jewish people because it was a Jewish temple. But there's other people that will say about this exact same passage that Zerubbabel made a giant mistake here. And he actually created that 10-year gap because he was unwilling to see that God was doing something and pulling more people into the kingdom. This was actually a blueprint of what he was going to do in the New Testament, bringing people who were not Jewish into the family of Yahweh. Bringing people in and, and making it what Jesus called a house of prayer for all nations. Welcoming in everyone who called on his name. But because they were unwilling to see what he was doing, because they were unwilling to accept the help, that help turned against them and made their life hell. Now, even if these were good people and even if they were trying to help, they probably shouldn't have done what they did next, which is lie about the situation and try and get Zerubbabel in trouble. And, and if, you're like, if you're like me, you've probably had some Zerubbabel moments where other people have tried to take you down even though you're doing nothing wrong. So tip number two is that the best work is often opposed. I found in my life I got it. Look at that. Look at that. And all these people were so willing to come help me. See, the, what a great team I have. I did that as a sermon example. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So my experience in my life has been that every time I have faced opposition, it's when I'm doing the best thing. The harshest opposition often comes during the situations where we are doing the things that we are most supposed to do. And my guess is in your life, you've probably seen this to be the case as well. If you're doing something that everybody already thinks that you're going along with the crowd, then nobody's going to stand up to you. But 
But there's something about doing the right thing, about following, your, about following Jesus and doing the right thing in your life or doing the right thing in your church or doing the right thing in your, in your group of friends. When you do the right thing, it is going to run into opposition because evil and, and brokenness is part of our world. To me, if you don't run into some sort of opposition, you're probably doing it wrong. Right? Like, if you have an easy path to doing what you're doing, there's probably something screwed up about that. That's one of the things I always tell people about, about your faith. As your faith grows, as you walk down the journey of, of Christianity, if it's easy for you, you're probably not experiencing, like, the kind of Christianity that Christ was calling you to. Because I don't know if you, if you read about this, but, like, 11 of his 12 friends died following him. They were killed. He was killed. There's something about doing the right thing, about following God, that runs you into opposition. And if you're not running into opposition, it's very possible you're just not running the right way. So Zerubbabel, even though he may have not accepted help and that may have been his own detriment, he didn't deserve to have those people come against him because he was doing what he was supposed to do. He didn't deserve to have people lie about him. He didn't deserve to have these things happen to him, but he endured. So after a decade, he decides to move forward, and that's where we get to tip number three. Sometimes you have to ask for forgiveness instead of permission. As you're rebuilding your life, you may run into situations where you really want to do something, and it's the right thing to do, and it may not be something where you can get it signed off on by all parties. Now, you notice I put a sometimes there, and maybe I should have capitalized the sometimes there, right? Because we can, you can also get into a lot of trouble with this. Like, if you just decide to go start building a house on your property this afternoon without permits, the city is not going to like that very much, and they don't care how much forgiveness you ask for. There are times and situations where that shouldn't happen in your life, but there are also times and situations where the way things are, are not necessarily the way that they should be. So I, I think back through the history of America and some of the protests that have happened in our society and the ways in which they've oftentimes pointed out things that were very, very wrong in our society. And initially, everybody thought, what are those jerks doing? Why don't they just sit down and shut up? But what they were doing was they were standing up for what they felt was the right thing to do. And ultimately, most of those things, a lot of those things, ended up shaping the way that our world is today. This is true all around the world. People who decided to do the right thing, even when there was an easy thing to do, ended up shaping the course of history. And when you're in a messed up, broken down place, like kind of like many of our lives are right now, Sometimes you just need to act. That's what Zerubbabel did. Technically, you could qualify what Zerubbabel did by rebuilding the temple as a failure or as a sin. Like he was going against the way that God wanted him to go. But really, when you think about it, he was acting in the way that he was told to go by the prophets and, and by the way that God was calling him. And eventually he just heard God's call and he took it as more authoritative than what he was hearing from the emperor. Zerubbabel had to decide that he was going to do what was right rather than what he was being told. And many of us face those sorts of situations in our lives. My caveat to that is that you should probably ask a few people around you whether what you're hearing is correct and not just, you know, decide to, to run off and do a bunch of things that you think are right that you're hearing in your head. Because some of the things we hear in our head are not the right things. They're just things that are, we're hearing in our head. Sometimes you have to ask for forgiveness instead of asking for permission. Which leads us to tip number four. What God inspires, God resources. So we saw the risk that Zerubbabel took. And he could have easily, completely, and totally failed. Right? Right? He could have easily not had anything left. He could have easily been jailed by the emperor. He could have been taken down, and the entire project could have been scrapped for all history. We never would have had a second temple. 
The whole project could have been shut down. All 40,000 of those Jewish people could have been sent back to other places in the kingdom. It could have all been done just because Zerubbabel didn't ask and wait for permission. He took a risk. He risked not only his own life, but he risked the lives of all the people that were helping him. And because he risked, because he was willing to step out, the second temple was built. The second temple was able to rise up from the ground. That Jerusalem was able to rise up from the ground. That we started to see that this place was built. This place was grown. This place was developed. And it was blessed by the emperor, not cursed. It was blessed by the way that God had called his people to act. And Darius decided to bless what was going on. And the temple became a beautiful new symbol for what happened when people took a chance. Now, what does this mean for you? What does it mean for me? Because none of us are building a temple in Jerusalem right now. At least I'm not. I can't speak for you. But I think all of us are building something, and some of us might need to take some risk to do it. Maybe you heard what Tish said this morning about how... um, God might be calling you to be more generous in your life, and maybe that's the risk that God is calling you to. Maybe there's something in your own life, maybe it's a personal relationship that you've been hiding from somebody for 13 months because you can, and now all of a sudden that you have to face them and figure out what you're going to do. Maybe God's calling you to build that out, to build that relationship back. Maybe, maybe God is calling you to, to, to get rid of some things that were part of your pre-pandemic life that probably didn't belong for a Christian, and to replace them with some healthier practices. And and maybe that's what God's calling you to do. And and that sort of work can be really, really difficult and tough. Maybe you've picked up a bad habit during the pandemic because no one was watching, and now God's calling you to throw that thing away. No matter what the thing is, God is, is, is the kind of God that when he calls you to do something, he doesn't leave you out on a limb. He comes behind you and resources it. I can only tell you story after story after story of ways that in my life when I've made the biggest risks, and I'm not a risk like, I'm not a risk lover, I'm, I'm somebody who does not like to take risks, but every time I've taken a risk, like God, and it kind of creates a little resentment in me that he keeps following up with the, because I, I keep hoping that like this next risk I'm going to take is going to totally fail so I won't have to take any risks anymore, but God keeps God keeps resourcing the risks, and when he keeps resourcing the risks, I'm like, oh man, now I'm going to have to make another risk. And he keeps pushing me and pushing me, and it's, it's what I'm learning over time is trust. Because when God calls you to something and he resources that something, he creates trust in you and a foundation for the next thing he's going to call you to. What is that next thing that God is going to call you to? He's going to resource it if it actually comes from him. He's going to send the people to support it if it's actually coming from him. And he's going to give you the opportunity to grow. So let's build something new together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us in such a way that you don't leave us out in the cold. That that you are able to love us in such a way that you call us to big things. And that you help us to grow. And that you help us to, to, to be grown. That you help us to accept help, to be able to step forward in a difficult path, and that you create trust in us. Lord, we are so grateful that you are a God who loves us so much, that you are willing and able to support us when you call us to something big, that you don't leave us out on a limb. And so, Lord, for those of us who are are thinking through our pre-pandemic life or our current life, and we're thinking through what are those things, that were there that don't need to be there anymore? What were those things that were, that were operating in my life that have no place in the life of somebody who follows Jesus? Would you help us, God, to ask for the help that we need, to step forward in faith, and would you come up behind us and give us what we need to do those things in your name? In Jesus' name.